Well, thank you, Pastor, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, it is afternoon. No, not quite. Good morning. I usually have the habit of saying good morning when it's early afternoon. I'm a, what you call a crazy mixed-up kid. Uh, do you use that expression in Canada? You don't. Well, over here we do. <laughs> anyway, it's lovely to see you all again, and uh, welcome to our presentation. And uh, we're really getting into the nitty-gritty now of the Book of Daniel. Those of you who have not been able to attend the previous ones, uh, you've missed a lot of material that will uh, contribute to understanding what we're talking about today. So uh, I'm sorry you're not able to do that, but you can perhaps try and catch up with the lessons afterwards. But uh, the book of Daniel actually starts on an important platform like the image on Daniel 2 that we see here on the left. And it builds up and as the prophecies move on uh, throughout the book, uh, the God is zooming in a little bit closer on certain details from that image uh, that, that it has taught. So let's just, uh, uh, let's just start as we carry on from where we were last week, and we're going to talk about the defiling of the sanctuary. And just a very, very quick review so far. You remember last week we examined the prophecy in uh, Daniel chapter 7, that dealt with the uh, dream that Daniel had in the first year of King Belshazzar of Babylon. Belshazzar was the last ruler, you remember, in the kingdom of Babylon before it was succeeded by the Medo-Persians. And uh, he saw these four beasts that came up out of the Mediterranean Sea area uh, due to the four winds striving down upon the sea. And there was the lion with eagle's wings, which was a very common feature that was known in ancient Babylon. The king of beasts or the king of uh, birds was a feature that was spoken of in the book of Jeremiah, and it's also featured on the tiles that uh, were on the procession street there in Babylon. And then that was followed by another beast, a bear that was standing up on one side that had three ribs in its mouth, and then a third beast came up out of the sea, uh, a leopard with four heads, uh, and four wings of a fowl. Now, at least these beasts resemble something similar to what we are accustomed to, though they had strange features about them, nevertheless. But the fourth beast that followed that one was a rather strange beast that was described as being different from all the other beasts. And therefore, uh, this beast, it caused great concern for Daniel. Now, what I mentioned a moment ago, the prophecies of Daniel were based on the, the basic prophecy that we have here in Daniel chapter 2 of this image that had a head of gold, arms and chest of silver, the thighs of brass or bronze, depending which translation of the Bible you use, uh, the legs of iron, and the feet that were part of iron and clay. And as Daniel explained to the king Nebuchadnezzar that the head of gold represented the kingdom of Babylon, well, these beasts came up representative uh, in parallel to these. So the lion with the eagle's wings represented the empire of Babylon. Then we have the arms and chest of silver representing the next kingdom, which was Medo-Persia, and that is symbolized by the lopsided bear. It was lopsided because Media was the main empire, but it was descending in sort of strength, and Persia was coming up uh, stronger. So it later became known just as the Persian Empire. And then that was followed by Greece, uh, which was represented there by the thighs of brass and also the four-headed leopard with the wings of a fowl. And then we have the empire of Rome, represented by the iron legs. And it was Gibbon, wasn't it, the famous historian who talked about the iron monarchy of Rome. Well, that beast there had great iron teeth as well. And then you notice the beast also had ten horns. Let me just go back, sorry. The beast had ten horns, representing the fragmenting of the Roman Empire uh, with the feet of iron and clay, some of it strong, some of it weak. And God said that the Empire of Rome would be divided, and they would try to unite together, but they would not hold together. And, of course, due to the barbaric hordes coming in from the northeast uh, into the Western Empire of Rome, the Roman Empire that was now weak was beginning to, to crumble. It wasn't holding together. And these ten uh, 
tribe that came in, seven of them formed the basis for the nation of Europe as we know them today. And then you noticed uh, amongst them in the, in the chapter on the beast there, in chapter 7, where we have more detail, Daniel noticed that another horn came up amongst the ten. This horn managed to uproot three of the horns, which we've identified before as the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. And uh, this horn was different to the others. It had a mouth speaking great things, and it had the eyes of a man. Uh, it was entirely different, and we have identified that little horn as what grew out of the Roman Empire. First of all, there was the Imperial Empire of Rome, which was a pagan empire ruled by the Caesars. And then, when the Empire of Rome was beginning to divide up due to these barbarians coming in, uh, uh, the Emperor of Rome, Justinian, he handed over the western part of his empire to the Bishop of Rome. And the Bishop of Rome, of course, took then the throne of Caesar and began to rule, not just in a religious sense, but also in a political sense, and that formed what became known as the Holy Roman Empire. Now, a lot of things took place during that empire uh, that we might uh, look upon with disdain because many, many things turned away. Because what happened, as you think through the history of these kingdoms, those previous kingdoms were pagan. And they had their pagan beliefs, their pagan practices, their cultures, and so on. And those practices and beliefs, they filtered down through the successive kingdoms into the Roman Empire. And when the Bishop of Rome took the seat in the West to consolidate the West, while Justinian tried to consolidate the eastern side of his empire, what happened? Those same practices were filtered down into the practices of the church. And so as a result, the church became corrupted by these things. So that's a very sad picture. And of course, the sequence of events that Daniel gives us in the seventh chapter of that prophecy of the four beasts, let's notice. And we've had this before, but I just want to remind you, it's very, very important that we have these sequences clear in our minds as we progress now through the remainder of the book of Daniel. <coughs> so remember, these are symbolic, the four winds representing war and strife and commotion, as the Bible has explained to us, we've seen that before. They were stirring up the great sea, the Mediterranean area, and as a result, four great beasts or kingdoms arose due to the warfare and the fighting and the intrigue that took place in that region. And the first beast that arose was the lion with eagle's wings, as we've noted, representing the Babylonian Empire. That was then succeeded by the lopsided bear, representing the Medo-Persian Empire. And then came the leopard with four heads and four wings of a fowl, representing the empire of Greece, uh, formed by the famous Alexander the Great. And then this nondescript, terrifying beast arose. This beast that caused great consternation to Daniel. It arose representing the Roman Empire, and then three of those horns were uprooted in order to make way for the little horn that had eyes of a man and the mouth speaking great things against God. And then the description goes on in Daniel 7 because it says that after the little horn had come on the scene and had performed its power and its control as it did, it says the judgment took place in heaven. And uh, then the nondescript beast with the little horn were put to death, they were destroyed, and Christ received his eternal kingdom. Those are the sequences. Now this afternoon we shall be talking about the judgment. All right, we're coming to that point. But this morning we're going to have a look at the defiling of the sanctuary. And so the vision of Daniel 8 that followed, it comes onto the scene, it took place in vision, as it were, by the river Uli there in, uh, in, uh, in Babylon, uh, the empire of Babylon, I mean, not the city. And then he saw some other beasts that came. Now these beasts were somewhat different to the other beasts that we've seen, but as we shall note, they were zooming in 
a little bit closer on the aspects that have been given in Daniel 7. It's like when you're flying in an aircraft. I remember once when we were coming back from, uh, I think it was from, from Hong Kong, and my wife and I were flying out of Hong Kong to Heathrow, and uh, it was a night flight, and the plane, if you know which route it's going, it's showing because it shows you on the little map that you got on your sat-nav in the, in the aircraft. It was flying right over China. And I looked out of the window, and I could see a little light in the distance, a single light. But as we came closer, that light began to magnify into a number of lights. And as we came even closer, we were flying over a huge city. You, you, you've had the experience, I'm sure. The closer you come, the more detail you see. So it's like this. Daniel 2 is like the light in the distance. We come to Daniel 7, it's come a little bit closer. You're beginning to see more detail. And Daniel 8, you're even closer still and you see a fuller picture. So here we have a picture showing what took place. This ram was beside the river and the ram had two horns. One was longer than the other and that one came up second. Now Daniel was told by the angel who accompanied him the vision, you remember, that that ram represented the Medo-Persian Empire. Now, the Medo-Persian Empire had not yet taken over Babylon. That, was, that prophecy was given in the third year of King Belshazzar's reign. Uh, and uh, it's, you know, it was a future event, but he said it would be the Medo-Persian Empire. And the bigger horn represented, of course, uh, the kingdom of Persia. And then, as he looked at this, he saw another beast that, that came. Uh, well, first of all, this, this beast was charging westward, northward, and southward simply because it came from the eastern direction. Now, note that because from Babylon, Persia would be coming from the east, okay? And then he noticed a male goat came from the west, from the opposite direction. And this was the first kingdom that came from the west because Babylon had been an eastern kingdom. Persia was even further east. Now this other goat came from the west, which we are told represented the empire of Greece. It tells you that later on in the chapter of Daniel 8. Remember what I've mentioned before, that in the visions of Daniel 7 and Daniel 8, in the first half of the chapter, it describes what was seen in the vision. The second half of the chapter is what the angel explains to Daniel what it means. You understand? So now further on in the chapter, it says that that male goat represents the empire of Greece. And remember, this is still way on in the future. You know, God is able to do that, isn't he? Because our God is omniscient. It's one of his attributes. God knows what's going to happen. And uh, do you remember when we were talking about Babylon? We had a text on the screen given by the prophet Isaiah which uh, prophesied the fall of Babylon about 150 years into the future. And in that prophecy it gave the detail of how Babylon would fall by the sluice gates that sealed off the city on the riverbeds of the Euphrates and so on would be left open and the waters would be dried up and it mentioned that Cyrus 150 years in ahead, it mentioned the name of King Cyrus of Persia who would come and take that city. God is so accurate. And that the prophet of God, when he utters what God reveals to him, is uttering the truth, which is quite a contrast to some of these modern-day prophets we often hear of who do a lot of guesswork and surmising, you know, and they don't get everything right. However... Here we are. The male goat came from the west, representing the Greek Empire, and it, it had a notable horn between its eyes. And uh, the prophet was told by the angel that horn, <coughs> me, <coughs> that that horn represented the first king of Greece, which we know was Alexander, uh, and he was the founder of the Greek Empire, so he became known as Alexander the Great. And the prophecy says 
that the male goat ran at the ram with savage force. It was full of anger towards this other beast, and it broke its two horns. And it goes on to say that there was no one who could stand against it and deliver it. In other words, the empire of Greece totally took over and destroyed the power of the Persian Empire, and that's exactly what happened. And the male goat then grew very great. We call him Alexander the Great, don't we? And it, so it goes on to say that the male goat grew very great, but when he was at the height of his power, that horn was broken. In other words, Alexander died. And in his stead, the four prominent horns came up towards the north, the east, the south, and the west, in the four directions of the compass. And we know that when Alexander died, he hadn't appointed a successor, and his four generals, they divided the empire between themselves. And so we found that the empires uh, of Greece was thus subdivided. Ptolemy took the south, Seleucus took the east, Cassander had Macedon, and uh, Lysimachus he had Thrace and up there in Turkey and around that area. And so out of one of these horns came the little horn that arose. Now that little horn was addressed in Daniel 7, the eyes of a man and the mouth speaking great things that we've identified as the paper set. But the zooming in now tells us more about this little horn because it brings in the power of Rome before the papacy took over and then how that power was transferred into the papal rule there in the West. And so one of these four horns, uh, out of them came this little horn. And this little horn, it says, grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and towards the beautiful land, which is, of course, a reference to Palestine, because as far as Daniel and his people are concerned, that would be their beautiful land. Yeah? I remember, you know, when I was doing evangelism in Eastern Europe, uh, and I, I used to say to the people, you know, uh, that I, we're spe in England we're speaking the language of heaven. You know, I used to have a little bit of rapport with them. And one day the ministers came to me and they said, uh, they used to call me brat, which took a little bit of getting used to. But I found out that brat meant brother in their language, you understand? And they'd come and say, brat Michael. Uh, we've all decided when we get to heaven, we're all going to speak English, you see. So uh, I said, oh, uh, and how do you work that one out? I really fell, fell for this one. And they said, well, brother, because the English can't speak any other language. <laughs> However, nevertheless, there we are. But, but, but uh, the beautiful land was Palestine. Okay, and then it tells us that this little horn, this is where we left off last week, then it acted arrogantly against Christ and his people, and it defiled the sanctuary and removed the regular burnt offering. So we're going to have a look at that defiling of the sanctuary uh, this morning. And it cast truth to the ground. Now, what is truth? Well, John 17 and verse 17, Jesus says, God's word is truth. All right? And that's what we as Adventists do. We measure all teachings by the Word of God, because the Word of God is the foundation uh, of our belief, all right? It's Christ-centered, and it's measured by the Word of God. And it cast the truth, that's God's Word, that it teaches to the ground. So let's have a look now, as we move into this theme this morning, in the defiling of the sanctuary, let's just have a look and notice once again what it tells us here in the book of Daniel. First of all, there's the description. <coughs> you must excuse me. My throat's a little bit dry today. My mouth is getting dry, and my, mouth, my, my water is running out. So, uh, thank you. <laughs> he got the hint. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. Uh, it says here in Daniel 8, verses 10 to 12, and this is the description of the vision still continuing here, it grew, that's the little horn, grew as high as the host of heaven. It threw down to the earth some of the host of the stars. Now remember, it's speaking here in symbolic terms, and it trampled on them. Even against the prince of the host, who's that? It must be Jesus, mustn't it? 
He's a, he's a prince. Even against the prince of the host, it acted arrogantly. It took the regular burnt offering away from him and overthrew the place of his sanctuary. Because of wickedness, the host was given over to it together with the regular burnt offering and it cast truth to the ground and kept prospering in what it did. So this was quite disturbing information to Daniel. If you read the chapter, you will realize that as you read on there. And so later on in that chapter, when the angel Gabriel actually was sent to explain this to him, notice what he said in the explanation that was given. And I see Pastor Mark bringing me a jug here. Um, thank you very much, my, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, my brat Mark. Um, <laughs> brat means the brother, don't forget that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so the explanation he says here in verses 23 to 25, he says, A king of bold countenance shall arise, skilled in intrigue. He shall grow strong in power, shall cause fearful destruction, and shall succeed in what he does. He shall destroy the powerful and the people of the holy ones, and by his cunning he shall make deceit prosper under his hand, and in his own mind he shall be great. Without warning he shall destroy many, and shall even rise up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken, and not by human hands." Did you get that last bit there? He shall be broken and not by human hands. Do you remember in Daniel 2, we didn't mention it in our summing up this morning, but they, after the feet of iron and clay, do you remember the dream showed a, a stone being cut out without hands that represented the kingdom of Christ that would come in the second coming and it says it would be, grow into a great mountain and fill the whole earth and it shall never pass away, it would last forever. It's interesting that when it describes that, it used this same expression, it was cut out, but not by human hands. Do you remember that? Okay, same language here. The kingdoms of the world, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, they've all come about due to some human impact by battle, by subterfuge, and whatever. But, this kingdom, Shall not, be bro uh, shall not be broken by human hands, but by God's act, all right? The second coming is God's making. And so it is that he will rise up against the prince of princes, but he, this little horn, shall be broken, but this time not by human action, but by God's action, God's intervention. Do you remember the true philosophy of history that we've said do you remember what it is? The true philosophy of history is that sometimes we may wonder if God has backed off, if God has left us and forgotten us. It's, it, it, you know, God allows people, he puts people in power, he allows them to come into position, but he has the power to remove them. But he gives everyone an opportunity to exercise, you know, themselves in the right way. It's their choice if they go the wrong way. But uh, eventually, he will step in. And that's what God will do at the very end. You know, we lose our loved ones and we, we feel lost, but we have the assurance that one day Jesus will come again and raise our loved ones together. And then we're united together once again. That's a wonderful thing to look forward to, isn't it? It's called the blessed hope in the New Testament and a wonderful assurance. And so, dear friends, not by human hands, God is going to intervene and bring this power to an end, as we shall see. And so, summing up here, the activities of the little horn, it grew to the host of heaven. In, in other words, it reached out to, 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 to heavenly uh, powers. It, it sought to usurp those powers. It threw some of the host and the stars to earth and trampled on them. In other words, Christ and his people, uh, and uh, it acted arrogantly against the Prince of Hosts. It was arrogant against Christ. Uh, well, you notice some of the things we read last week from their own writings, from their own statements, uh, that 
you know, even claiming to have the power of Jesus Christ on earth and to change it. I was reading a little catechism just to refresh my mind the other day that I, I got, I showed you last week, and it, it says by the church believes that by its own authority it can actually change what God has said, which is a blasphemous position to take. And please understand what I'm saying here. Uh, I, I have to say some things that sometimes can be unpleasant to hear, and it's not my intention to to offend or hurt anyone, you know, who is of that faith. Because I know a number of people who are devout Roman Catholics, and they're some very good people. They are, you know, they're sincere and genuine in what they are. So we're not talking about the individuals. We're talking about a system that has become corrupted uh, through history, as we can see. I had one historian say to me once when I was in Birmingham giving some lectures uh, on these things, and uh, he was a Roman Catholic, and he said to me, he said, it's right what you're saying. He says, the problem is the Roman Church has taken on a lot of baggage on its journey, and that, that is true. That's exactly what we are seeing here. So, please understand. So, it acted arrogantly against the prince of the host. It took away the regular burnt offering from the prince of the host. So Christ's regular burnt offering, what it symbolizes, that was taken away. And it overthrew the place of his sanctuary. Uh, in other words, what the sanctuary represents, the lesson, the teaching, the truth of it, was removed and replaced with something else. So it cast truth to the ground, as it says. It cast aside the teachings of the Bible in this respect. And it kept prospering in what it did, uh, and a king of bold countenance, it says, he, he was skilled in intrigue. This is perhaps indicative on the little horn in Daniel 7 that had eyes of a man, a, a sort of sign of, of acumen, you know, uh, and the, the ability to, to speak out uh, and, to, and to do that. He grew strong in power. And uh, indeed, when we look at the days of the Holy Roman Empire, I think I explained to you how Henry IV had to make his way over the mountains in winter uh, and stand barefoot in a courtyard in rather poor clothing, barefoot in the freezing snow in the courtyard for three days and three nights before the Pope would allow him entrance to accept his request for forgiveness. And uh, that's the power that was yielded over the rulers of Europe by the Bishop of Rome. <clears throat> he caused fearful destruction, and he destroyed the powerful and the saints, and the prophecy says he prospered deceitfully, and he destroyed many and rose up against the Prince of Princes. But as we've not noted already, he would ultimately be destroyed, not by human hands, but by God. <clears throat> All right. You remember this? <clears throat> A Tale of Two Cities? That was our first presentation in the book of Daniel, wasn't it? And uh, the empire of Babylon came and subjugated the kingdom of Judah. The people of Jerusalem were now under the rule of Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed and the city was destroyed and Nebuchadnezzar, he looked upon this as a great victory because he was a pagan and his gods had given him the victory over the God of Israel. Now, historically, the pagans around were somewhat terrified of the God of Israel. Because you remember when Israel came into the promised land, just before that, the spies were told by Rahab in Jericho, we've heard what your God did to the Egyptians. We've heard what your God did to these others who attacked you in the wilderness and so on and so forth. And so we're terrified. We're, we're shaking at the knees. You see, the God was judged by his power. The more powerful the God was, the greater the God was, in the eyes of these ancients. And so now here is Nebuchadnezzar coming along and saying, ha, ha, my God 
is even greater than your God. So Babylon becomes a symbol or a typology of the spiritual situation later on in history, in the days that we are now living in, when ancient Babylon no longer exists, just a pile of dust and rubble, but the Bible speaks in the book of Revelation as Babylon, of a fallen church, of a church that has fallen away from the truth of God's word. There's only two cities that are mentioned in the book of Revelation, apart from the cities of the seven churches, there are different contexts, but the two cities, that's Babylon and Jerusalem. And it's not talking about the current Jerusalem out there in Palestine, it's talking about the new Jerusalem, all right? A representation of God's kingdom. So here the tale of two cities in the historical setting is a typology or a an illustration of the spiritual situation that is to arise into the future. That, going back from Daniel's day, that's what it was. Now we're living in that future, okay? And so the kingdom of Babylon represents the kingdom of Satan. And the kingdom of Jerusalem represents the kingdom of Christ. So we have not just the tale of the two cities, but also the contest of the God. And you remember, Satan wanted to be God when he was an angel, didn't he? Lucifer, he says, I will be like the Most High God. But God had to bring him down. And, and it's through the cross of Calvary, let's not forget that, that Jesus won the victory over Satan. So those who belong to Christ, even though it may sometimes appear in this world, dear friends, that the kingdom of Satan is taking control and is... is, is you know, is on the winning side. It's not the case. Because in the true philosophy of history, Christ will one day step in and say, that's enough. I will now intervene. And in two weeks' time, when we come to the close of this series, I will show you how Christ will do that in a very dramatic way. Not just in the second coming, but at a time of trouble that comes just before the second coming of Jesus. So don't miss these next two presentations. This afternoon is important when we look at the judgment, but just let's follow this through because it's a thrilling journey to look at in these prophecies. Now, in the book of Daniel, there are three main parallels in chapter 8. First of all, there's a parallel between Daniel chapter 7 and chapter 8 that we've already noted again this morning. There is a da parallel between Daniel 8 and Daniel 9. We'll be coming into Daniel 9 this afternoon and next week. And then there's a parallel, be parallel between Daniel 8 and the remaining chapters, chapters 10, 11, and 12. Three main parallels, and we're going to have a look at these from now right through to the end of this series. They're very important. They all link together in these three parallels. There are also four significant contrasts that we need to notice. One is the language. I mentioned this to you, I think, last week. In Daniel chapter 1 through to chapter 7, it's written in, no, in Ara Aramaic. <laughs> okay? So the other one is Hebrew. From Daniel 8 onwards to the end of the book, it's written in Hebrew. Now, why is that? I'll tell you in a moment. Uh, the next is significant contrast between the beasts. Did you notice that the beasts of Daniel 7 are wild beasts? All right? Would you like to meet a lion or a leopard on the road? No? But would you mind meeting a lamb? I mean, a, a ram or a he-goat? You see the difference? The wild beasts in Daniel 7 representing the kingdom uh, that we've explained the other beasts that we re read, even though they represent those kingdoms, they move into a different aspect. Because the ram and the he-goat are sacrificial beasts. Have you noted that? They're sacrificial beasts. The rams and he-goats were what were used for the sacrifices, the monster sacrifices. There were lambs, there were bulls, and so on. But they were not wild animals. 
sacrificial beast. The book of the chapter 8 of Daniel and the remainder of the book of Daniel is all the expansion on chapter 8 now is based on the sanctuary. Sanctuary is very important. All right? The sacrificial beast. In other words, we're looking at this from a different perspective now. In the first seven chapters, we're looking at it from a world perspective of empires, of kingdoms, of human rulers. Now we're looking at it from heaven's perspective. In the true philosophy of history, God is saying, look, I know what's going to happen. I'm telling you beforehand. This will give you that confidence in what I'm telling you. You'll see it. As it's fulfilled, it will stand confirmed before you. I know what's going to happen, and I want to assure you that I am going to win because I've gained the victory at Calvary. All right? What does it say in Revelation 12? We overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb through his sacrifice. So, dear friends, it's from a different perspective. Therefore, the language also changes because Aramaic was the common lingua franca, all right? But the Hebrew language, even today, is the religious language, all right? My wife and I joined a group of Jews once when we were on holiday to welcome in the Sabbath on a Friday evening. And guess what? Their prayers and their hymns were all in Hebrew. Unfortunately, my wife and I had to sort of la la la, you know. But Hebrew is the sacred language of the Jews, even to their religious today. So God changes the whole tenor from wildness to the common language to sanctuary imagery and to the religious aspect because God is now saying this is now how I'm revealing to you what really is going on behind the scenes operating in vision before you as you can see as, as the behind the scenes are allowing things to happen around in the world today <coughs> all right and then it speaks in sanctuary terms, therefore, as we've mentioned. And you see this, it focused, its focus then is now on the defilement of the sanctuary, bearing in mind what that little horn has done. You see, Daniel 8 to 12 concentrates on not only the defilement of the sanctuary that we've now come to in our study, but also in the restoration the sanctuary. And that will tie in with what we're going to talk about this afternoon. So bear with me and uh, let's come. So Daniel 8 is unique for several reasons as well. First of all, the theme of Daniel 8, believe it or not, but perhaps you can appreciate it now in what I've just told you, is the redemption of God's people. The theme of Daniel 8 is the redemption of God's people. The bottom line is that even though God's people have been the object of attack as an indirect attack by Satan upon Christ himself, through his cross, Jesus will bring full and complete redemption, vindication, and deliverance to his people. The second thing is that the Son of God gave light and meaning to the vision. Uh, you see, several noted Bible scholars and uh, I quote here Calvin and Wordsworth as examples, they recognize that it must have been the Son of God himself who answered the question that we're going to read in Daniel 8, verse 13. We'll come to it in a bit. And there is an even stronger indication in verses 15 and 16 that it could have been none other than Jesus himself who gave orders to the angel Gabriel to go and help Daniel understand the vision concerning the sanctuary. The third point is that this is the first time that we read in the Bible the expression, the time of the end. The time of the end. Now, 
please, friends, make sure you make a distinction between the last days and the time of the end. When do the last days begin? Well, they begin with the New Testament period. Because in the book of Hebrews, and the opening verses, it says, God has spoken to us through various prophets and so on, you know, through the, the past, through the prophets, that in these last days, speaking of the present term, in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son. All right? But the time of the end, we can say, are the last days of the last days. Okay? And the time of the end comes in, well, you'll see it tied in this afternoon, you see how it ties in. The last days come when that little horn power of activities have its supremacy comes to an end. Around 1798, that period of time. In Daniel 8, 15 and 16, Gabriel was sent by Christ to help Daniel understand the vision, and the rest of the book is mainly what Gabriel explained to Daniel. Daniel 12, verse 4, that we come to in two weeks' time, only at the time of the end would the book be unsealed as knowledge would be increased. In other words, God is limiting what this meant until it was appropriate to reveal what he was saying. It was only in the 19th century that scholars concluded that Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27, contained the explanation to unlock Daniel 8, verse 14. But it was even later that it was realized that Daniel's chapter 10, 11, and 12 are the com completion of Gabriel's explanation to the prophet Daniel. And the fourth uniqueness of this is that it was a sp uh, specifically to chapter 8 and its expansions in later chapters that Jesus pointed to when he was on earth. Because you remember what he said there in Matthew 24, 15. I put two translations here. The NRSV, which is the one that I use myself usually, <coughs> but also the King James Version. Jesus said, when you see the desolating sacrilege standing in the holy place, that's the sanctuary, as was spoken of by the prophet Daniel. In the King James, it says, when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. And then a fifth unique point is that Daniel 8.14 is the climax of symbolical representations of the book of Daniel. In other words, so far, the book of Daniel, the prophecies have been in symbol. Daniel 8.14 is the final symbol that we have here. The rest is in literal explanation. The explanation begun in verse 17 continues to the end of the book, to the end of chapter 12, and from that point onwards, it's no longer symbolical, but as we say here, it's literal representation. The reason being that Christ had instructed Gabriel to help Daniel understand. And as well as symbolical of the previous chapters, Daniel 8 is also the seed of chapters 9 through to the end of the book, as well as that of the New Testament eschatology. So what does the climactic or key verse of Daniel chapter 8 verse 14 actually state? Well, let's look at the previous verse first. Uh, it says, then I, that's Daniel, heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the one that spoke, for how long is the vision, this vision, concerning the regular burnt offering, the transgression that makes desolate, and the giving over of the sanctuary and the host to be trampled? How long is this, this defiling of the sanctuary going to be allowed to carry on for before something is done about it? You can almost hear that echoing in his question here. And he answered, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, and then shall the sanctuary be restored to its rightful place. That's verse 14, that's the key verse. Let's then have a look at the sanctuary, because we need to understand this before we can understand or relate it to the prophecy. God said to Moses, when the children of Israel were brought out of Egypt and brought into the wilderness, 
He said, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Exodus 25, verse 8. And this was a marvelous impression of what it was like because God, he gave instructions of how the sanctuary was to be set up, a courtyard with a tent structure and the Levites in their respective camps around the edge of the perimeter of this courtyard and then the children of Israel in their respective tribes around the outer section with the mixed multitude, that's the Egyptians who chose to come out with them, out on the perimeter. But right in the very center was the sanctuary. God giving the illustration that he should be in the very center of our lives, of our society, of our families, and so on. And the presence of God was indicated by a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. And uh, God led them in this way. So they had this visible evidence of the presence of God with them. And the sanctuary itself later became the great building structure that Solomon built, but it was on the same principle of the courtyard and the, instead of a tent structure, now a building structure. And uh, it, it, it symbolized that yet in a more elaborate form. So he said, have them make me a sanctuary so that I may dwell among them. And so he says, in accordance with all that I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and of all its furniture, so shall you make it. And so Moses had a blueprint. Now it doesn't mean to say that the blueprint uh, showed that in heaven we have these articles of furniture. Uh, these are symbolic of the plan of salvation, of God's plan for us. You see, the courtyard, uh, in the courtyard was the altar of sacrifice and the laver in which the priests would wash their feet and that before going into the tabernacle. Uh, and the courtyard itself represents the earthly ministry of Jesus. The tabernacle represents the heavenly ministry of Jesus. And so when we go into the tabernacle, as we can see here, sorry, uh, pressing the wrong button here. As we can see here on the cutaway, there are two apartments. There's the first apartment, and then there's the second apartment. The first apartment was called the holy place. The second apartment was called the most holy place. And in the first apartment, there were three items of furniture, the seven-branch lampstand, known as the um, menorah. Uh, there was a table of showbread on the right-hand side, and there was the altar of incense. Don't mix that with the altar of sacrifice that was in the courtyard. The altar of incense. Then there was a, a veil. You couldn't actually see through like this. It's cut away for us to explain. But the veil separated the two apartments. And in the most holy place was the Ark of the Covenant. We'll come to that in a bit. So let's come back to the courtyard. And the services became very complex because they were teaching various aspects in the plan of redemption. And Moda said that God did this because of your sin. He had to add to this in order to give you greater illustration. But I'm going to give you a very simple, basic understanding here for the sake of explaining here. The priest represented Jesus, uh, you know, who is our heavenly high priest, and the lamb that was sacrificed would be thus offered on the altar. The blood in some cases would be sprinkled around the altar. Uh, other cases, the blood would be taken into the sanctuary. There are different reasons for doing it. But let's just look at it basically here for, for the sake of this moment. The lamb had to be without any defect. It was without blemish, representing a perfect savior. That's why John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus coming, he said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He was using sanctuary language which was meaningful to the Jewish people. So the, 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 the priest, or if it was a personal offering, would the, 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 the penitent would place his hands on the head of this innocent lamb, or the priest would place his lamb, hands on as he's representing the people, uh, and he would confess their sins, so symbolically the sins were being transferred to the lamb teaching us a lesson that our sins are laid upon Jesus. All right? And then the lamb 
life was taken and the blood was caught and then the blood would be taken into the sanctuary by the priest and uh, he would bring the blood before the veil that is here. Uh, in other words, this was again symbolic of the fact that it is recorded in heaven, it is affirmed that our sins have been paid for by the blood of the Lamb and that we have salvation in Christ. Get the idea? That's the, that's the, that's the illustration that's given here. Now, let's go into the most holy place because this place uh, is significant to what we're going to talk about later. Um, here we have one item of furniture, a chest of wood that is known as the Ark of the Covenant. It was overlaid with gold and there were these two model angels uh, that were side by side known as the covering cherubim. Uh, Lucifer was in one of those positions before he fell because it says in Ezekiel he was the covering cherub. So they stand beside the throne of God and the Shekinah glory of God filled that. Uh, it was, uh, you know, a glory that filled the temple in, in, in the days when Solomon had the temple dedicated. And inside, underneath, was the Ten Commandments written on tablets of stone that God had given to Israel through Moses on Mount Sinai. Uh, because the lid is, becomes known as the mercy seat. Because it's before God that we come the Bible says sin is breaking God's law, or it's lawlessness. And God's law is as holy as God. If you read in the Bible, you see a comparison between the law of God, the Ten Commandments, and God, his character. And it says that both are holy, both are, are pure, both are righteous, both are good, both are just. It goes on. The parallels are the same. It represents the character of God. So God's throne is established upon his law, of his covenant, if you will, that, that he makes. Now, the ceremonial law, which is what the instructions that Moses received on how these sacrifices were to be conducted and so on, they weren't in such a prominent place. They were on a scroll written by Moses, as God instructed him, where the Ten Commandments were on solid granite, written by the finger of God himself, but the ceremonial law was placed in a pocket on the side of the ark. Now, the most holy place had a prominent feature on the Day of Atonement. It says there in Hebrews 9, I'm reading here from the New Testament, Hebrews 9, 6 and 7, it says the priests go continually into the first tent, that's the first apartment, to carry out their duties, but only the high priest goes into the second, that's the most holy place, and he goes in there just once a year and not without taking the blood that he offers for himself, because remember, this priest, though he represents Christ, he himself is a sinner like us. So he first of all needs to make atonement for himself before he can stand before the Shekinah glory of God. All right? And then he takes for the sins committed unintentionally by the people. And he goes into this most holy place and he sprinkles the blood before the Ark of the Covenant, making atonement uh, for this. Now, it's interesting, the high priest had bells attached to the hem of his garment. And this is an interesting thing, because when he was in there, the people were gathered outside the camp on the Day of Atonement. And uh, they would be anxiously waiting, will he come out safely? Because he's right there in the very presence of God, the Shekinah glory, will he be destroyed? And while they could hear the bells ringing, they knew he was safe. They were waiting for him to come out. When the high priest comes out, he represents the second coming of Christ. You understand? Bear that in mind. We'll come to that this afternoon. And so, the Day of Atonement, known as the Yom Kippur, it was to the Jews the Day of Judgment. That is a day of cleansing a day of restoration, of putting things right and of being re-consecrated to God. So on that day, it would be announced by the blowing of the shofar uh, and it would become a very sacred day. 
uh, where they had to gather around the camp. The two goats were chosen. I know I've got a lamb on the screen, but I didn't have a picture of a goat. Well, pretend it's a goat. Two goats were chosen. They cast lots. One was called the Lord's goat, and the other was called the scapegoat, or Azazel, the goat of sending away. And uh, so the blood was caught, and then the priest would take it in, and he would sprinkle it around the altar, the laver, and go into the tent, and he would sprinkle it before each of the items of furniture, before the veil, and then into the most holy place, and before the Ark of the Covenant. In other words, it, through the blood of Christ, what has been wrong in the people of God, in their lives, in everything they've done and said and so on, when it's repented of, it is forgiven. And God is going to restore what these things represent. Uh, so bear this in mind. The defiling is going to be restored. So he would sprinkle it before the altar of incense, before the veil, and then into the most holy place, making atonement. When he came out, atonement having been made, symbolically, the people are saved, Jesus has come, they're delivered. Second coming of Jesus. Then the second goat, the goat of sending away, Azazel, the scapegoat that it's sometimes referred to there, is brought. And the high priest places his hands on this, and he confesses or transfers the sins from himself the Satan. Now, some people misunderstand Adventists in this. They, I've heard it said that we make Satan our savior. That is not so. You know, I've spelled it out, the Bible is very clear, Jesus is our savior. We're saved only by Jesus. And Jesus has taken our sins. Remember, they were laid on him. He died for us. He goes into heaven. He intercedes on our behalf. He comes back again to take us home. The Bible says in Hebrews 9 that he ascended to heaven having obtained eternal salvation for us. When he comes back again the second time, what's he going to do? He's going to say to Satan, these sins belong to you. You start to cause them. You are the instigator of these things. They belong to you, not to my kingdom. They belong to your kingdom. Here you can have them back. That's the, the sort of principle, if you think of that. I'm putting it in a very blunt, simple way. And then it says, that goat is led out into the wilderness by the hand of a fit man. There's only one fit man who sends P Satan out into the wilderness, and that's Jesus. And where did he send him? The Bible talks of the millennium, where the earth is a desolate wilderness. And that's where he will be when God will finally bring his destruction about. So that's the lesson. Now it tells us here, the typology of the earthly sanctuary was symbolic of the plan of redemption. And it says they offer worship in a sanctuary that is a sketch in shadow of the heavenly one. So don't, don't get the idea, friends, I know some folk do, and there's no, I'm not condemning folk for that, uh, that in heaven there's a sanctuary like this. This is symbolic of the great throne room of the universe that is acting for the redemption of mankind. All right? It's, it's a shadow of the heavenly one. In other words, it's a typology of the great plan of salvation. The shadow isn't the real thing, but it tells you that the real thing is there. All right? And uh, uh, Moses was about to erect the tent, was warned, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you in the mount because it's teaching truth, and therefore truth has to be represented correctly. And so Hebrews 10, he says, since the law has only a shadow of the good things to come, and that's speaking about that law of ceremonies, the instruction of the sanctuary service and so on. It's a shadow of things to come, the typology, and not the true form of these realities. It can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered year after year, make perfect those who approach. It goes on, every high priest stands day after day at his service, offering again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. It goes on. But when Christ 
came as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and perfect tent, that's talking about the reality that heaven is controlling there, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy place, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, thus notice, obtaining, or as my New Revised Standard puts it, having obtained, I like that emphasis, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For we are told that without the shedding of blood, Hebrews 9.22, there is no forgiveness of sin. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Dear friends, when you and I get to heaven, it will be for one reason and one reason alone. And that is because Jesus has died for you and for me. Not for any good that we have done, but because he took our place and paid the price. Let's make no mistake about it. And that sacrifice of Jesus was once and for all. We don't need to keep reiterating that sacrifice because he's done it. He's accomplished that. It tells us, you know that you were redeemed, says Peter, from, or ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb, without defect or blemish. And remember John said, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Do you see the sanctuary symbolism? It's very clear, isn't it? Very clear. That's why Daniel 8 is now in the sanctuary perspective because it's focusing around this great control room, if you like, of the universe where God is working out the history of salvation for those who put their faith in him. And so it says in Hebrews 9 that Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time. Not to deal with sin, He's already done that at the cross. But to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. And this great truth is something that was recognized by some of the great reformers. And this is why, you know, the Church of Rome had to bring in other ideas to try and divert attention from the truth to what was being restored here about the great teachings of salvation, teachings that had been pushed aside and replaced by a counterfeit doctrine or set of doctrines. And so they brought in other ideas like Antiochus Epiphanes and the secret raptures and all these things. They all came in through the Jesuits. <coughs> However, what did Jesus mean? And just before he died, he, he made that announcement on the cross. He said, it is finished. What did he mean? Well, he meant he had kept his promise to redeem us through his own blood. And secondly, the price of our sins had been paid. He died once for all, the Bible says. He fulfilled what the ceremonial law symbolized by the service of that ancient sanctuary foretold in its typology. He fulfilled it. Because the record tells us, then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and he breathed his last. And then it says at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. That temple curtain, remember, friends, was too high for human hands to reach. They'd need scaffolding to get up there. If a human did it, they'd tear it from the bottom to the top. It says there was a great earthquake. No doubt a divine hand rent that curtain. Josephus tells us that that curtain, now it's in my mind that he said four inches thick. I read something the other day, two inches thick. But either, whichever it is, I can't fully remember, which either it is, that was very thick to tear. It took a divine hand. It had to be thick to shield the Shekinah glory that was behind it. And that glory had departed. And I can imagine the scenario here that as that evening sacrifice was about to be offered, the priest was taken off guard as the earth shook and the temple veil rent and he looked around in shock and horror to see the glory of God had departed. You could see right into the most holy place. He dropped the knife and the lamb got away. 
because there was no more need for the shadow to function because the reality had fulfilled his promise. He had ratified the promise he had given there on Calvary's cross. And the great high priest, Jesus, he ascends to heaven to represent us. He rose again, he ascended to heaven, and he represents us there, dear friends, in the heavenly kingdom. That's why in a church today, we don't need to have an altar. Because an altar requires a sacrifice. And we don't need a sacrifice. Christ is our sacrifice. An altar requires a sacrifice, and a priest is required to offer the sacrifice. We don't need a priest, because Christ is our high priest in heaven. You don't read in the New Testament of the early Christian church having altars or priests. It talks of the church family being a household of priests. We are priests unto God. We represent him to the world today. Jesus replaced the sacrifice with the Lord's Supper, a service of remembrance. Do you see the beauty of it? Truth is gradually being restored through the great reformation. And so it, oh, I should have read that text, that we have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the sanctuary in the true tent that the Lord and not any mortal has set up. Hebrews 8, 1 and 2. And in Hebrews 7, he says that he holds his priesthood, how long? Permanently. Because he continues forever. Friends, we don't need another priest to stand in his place. The earthly priests, they perish, they die. But this Jesus, this high priest, he lives for eternity. Consequently, he is able for all time to save those who approach God through him. Not through Mary, not through the saints, but through Jesus. Since he always lives to make intercession for them. Again, John writes, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He's the bridge builder. He's the one who links us together. And he is the atoning sacrifice, he says, for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the entire world. Because remember, Jesus died for everyone. So what does that invitation of Jesus mean to you and me? It means, dear friends, that we believe in Jesus as our personal saviour. We don't need to believe in a human system. We believe in the divine provision. Jesus is our Savior. He came and he comes direct, when we come directly to Jesus in true repentance, confessing our sins, he accepts it. He says, I, he comes to me, I will not cast away. To accept his righteousness as our very own because without his righteousness we are unrighteous. We receive him into our lives through the presence of the Holy Spirit. And by being born again in this way, we then are baptized into Christ. Because baptism by immersion represents that dying to the old life and rising to a new life in Jesus Christ. And to trust his grace as we seek to follow his word and obey all of his commandments. And that's called righteousness by faith in the Bible. Because the life we now live, we live by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. Galatians 2, verse 20. And so we now are preparing for his glorious return. What a wonderful story this puts together, doesn't it? So what does the Antichrist mean? We need to just come to this before we close up. What does the Antichrist mean? Well, very quickly, because I see my time is now going. But the word antichrist comes from two Greek words. The word anti that means instead of or in place of, and the word Christos, which is translated Christ in our English, it means the anointed one. So the antichrist means to someone who replaces Christ. That is a usurper or a counterfeiter and his, uh, of Jesus and his ministry. Um, let's just put that in there. <clears throat> All right. And uh, no one has the right, nor the ability, nor the power, whatever they claim, 
to take the place of Gilgal. Anyone who claims to be doing so more than, uh, more than he should is really spoken of in the Bible as a deceiver. John writes these two statements. He says in 1 John 2, <coughs> Children, it is the last hour, as you have heard, that the Antichrist is coming. So many Antichrists have come. So there's not just one, there are many people who try to take the place of Christ, take his position, for, for this we know that it is the last hour. And then he says, many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. In those days, there was a, um, uh, a false teaching known as docetism. Docetism did not accept that Jesus personally came in human, in human flesh. It claimed that he came with the appearance of in human flesh, but it was a, a, a sort of deceitful manifestation, a pretense. No one knew. They didn't realize. You touch him, you speak to him, you handle him. But he really wasn't in human flesh. That's docetism. And so John writes this, that this, this teaching is also a deceptive and antichrist doctrine. Now notice what the Apostle Paul says in Thessalonians, because this is coming back to our point. He says, let no one deceive you in any way. For that day, and he's speaking about the coming of Jesus, will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the lawless one is revealed. The one destined for destruction, remember? Be destroyed without human hands. God will do it. He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, declaring himself to be God. Remember what we read last week from Roman statement? The Pope is Jesus Christ on earth. The Pope is ruler of heaven, uh, of hell, of purgatory, of uh, earth, and of heaven. Uh, you know, he sits in the temple of God claiming to be God. That's what Paul said. And Paul was a prophet. Do you not remember that I told you these things when I was still with you? And you know what is restraining him, so that he may be revealed when his time comes. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work but only until the one who now restrains it is removed. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will destroy with the breath of his mouth, annihilating him by the manifestation of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is apparent in the working of Satan, who uses all power, signs, lying wonders, and every kind of wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. If people don't want to accept the truth, that's their choice. God will respect that. But they will take the consequences. God's word will come true. In the city of Worms in Germany is this famous monument. If you've been there, you will have seen this. It stands out there. <coughs> Excuse me. It's called the Reformation Monument. Sometimes it's briefly referred to as the Luther Monument. It, it's more, it's the Reformation Monument. There is Martin Luther uh, on the pedestal in the center here, uh, Savonola, I think it is, and John Calvin, and uh, even uh, some like Frederick the Wise and, and so on, uh, his protector uh, uh, and so on among the princes. <coughs> and this is what um, George Ladd in the book Blessed Hope wrote. He says, many of the great Christians of Reformation and post-Reformation time shared this view of prophetic truth and identified Antichrist with the Roman papacy. Among adherents of the interpretation were the Waldenses, the Hussites, that's John Wycliffe, Martin Luther, John Calvin, Ulrich Zwingli, Melanchthon, Tyndale, Latimer, and Ridley. Uh, remember Latimer and Ridley, they were burnt at the stake in Oxford. But they believed, they interpreted the prophecies of Daniel and they recognized uh, this, because the defiling of the sanctuary, the losing of those great truths that the papacy had pushed aside and replaced with these false counterfeit teachings, were now being identified and they were coming back in the Reformation with the great truth of God's word. Truth was being restored. The great doctrine of the sanctuary, its message was being restored once again.
<coughs> R.A. Anderson's Unfolding Daniel's Prophecies, he says, leaders such as Luther, Calvin, Knox, and Cramer pointed to Daniel 7 and Revelation 17, identifying the great apostasy with the headquarters in Rome. The scriptural message of Revelation 18.4 formed the basis of many of their sermons, which said, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. And John Wycliffe, known as the Morning Star of the Reformation here in Britain, he said that the Pope is Antichrist here on earth. So how much pain, said Martin Luther in his book, oh, how much pain it has caused me, though I had the scriptures on my side, that I should dare to make a stand alone against the Pope and hold him forth as Antichrist. T'was so I fought with myself and with Satan, till Christ by his own infallible word fortified my heart against these doubts. It's the word of God, dear friends, that brings them home. And so by substituting the counterfeit teaching, the papacy has defiled the sanctuary of Christ. Here's a summary. Tradition has been taken above the scriptures. Protestant position is sola scriptura, scriptures alone. The papacy says we take tradition and scripture, and tradition has more authority above the scriptures. I'm not telling you what they claim. I'm not making false accusations. You can check it out. You can check it out. It's what they claim. At least they're honest about what they've done. Whereas Protestants will come and try and argue the case from the scriptures to support what they've done. <coughs> salvation by works replaces salvation by free grace. In introducing penances and indulgences and, and Crusades, uh, not crusades, uh, uh, pilgrimages, I mean. The spurious claims of the priesthood, the claim that the priest, and of course, having a priest in the church is not what the Bible teaches, it's opposite, as we've noticed. Having a confessional, where you go to the priest and you ask his forgiveness for your sins. I told you last week I'd share something with you. Last year, my wife and I celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary. And we treated ourselves to something special by going to Peru. We wanted to go and see somewhere we'd never been. We went to see the Machu Picchu and lots of interesting places. But there's one thing that really upset both of us. You know, we went in a group that Saga arranged. We went to a small group, about, dozen, uh, about six couples. And... Uh, <coughs> They had to hire guides to different places, and we went to the town or the city of Cuzco, C-U-Z-C-O, and we were taken into this Roman Catholic cathedral. Now, we were not allowed to take any photographs in the cathedral, which is a shame, because I would have shown them to you. But if you go to Cusco, you can go in the cathedral. And the first thing that shocked us was a huge statue of Jesus as crucifix. You know, it must have been as high as this wall, not higher, it was on the side wall of this huge cathedral. Jesus nailed to the cross, and around his waist was a very pretty white frilly petticoat, which to me, I don't know why that was like that, obviously signified something to them, but to me, that presented Jesus in a wrong light. I thought it was rather blasphemy. Anyway, the point I want to come to, we were taken into one of the chapels and one of the altars, they're all gold and glitter and there's images of various saints around and including Mary. Mary was everywhere, always is. I think Mary would turn in a grave if she knew. <coughs> and the guide told us, representing the Catholic Church, that, you know, when they were converting the pagans, the Incas and so on there in in Peru, the church adopted to them, and so Jesus came to replace the male gods, and Mary came to replace the female gods. She's now situated as the queen of heaven. That's why she was in the highest position on the altar, or the facade behind the altar. And then we were taken somewhere else, and someone said, what's that 
chair there is a big wooden throne. And on the back of it was the painting of a sun, an S-U-N, the thing that shines in the heavens, you know? He says, oh, that, that is a confessional. Really, that's different to the confessionals we're used to seeing, you know? Uh, and uh, he says, yes, the penitent comes and they kneel before that seat and they pray to the sun for the forgiveness of their sins. Now they go, so I thought this was supposed to be a Catholic church. It seems more like a pagan temple. But that didn't say anything. My wife and I were looking at each other and we were very disturbed because I've been to Rome and I've seen things in Rome that I don't approve of, but not to this extent. And then, and I'm thinking, well, here I am in someone else's church. I have to be respectful as I would expect them to be in mine. And then somebody says, what's the window in the dome for? So we looked up, a huge dome, and there was a circular window right in the centre, very much like the Pantheon in, in Rome. The guy said, oh, he says, that is the way of salvation. That is the only way of salvation. It's the only way you can be saved. The only way of salvation. Now I'm listening. He says, the only way of salvation is by those two apostles and the sun, the S-U-N, that shines. I could contain myself no longer. And I just came out, I said, really? And he looked at me. I said, really? Yeah, it's the only way. I said, and I understood it was through the blood of Christ. And he said to me, oh, that, that, that's another way. I said, no, 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 you said that's the only way. He didn't want to say any more. No one in the group said anything. But when we went out, I noticed everybody walked past him. They didn't give him any, any, you know, what you call it, tip. <laughs> but, you know, I was so horrified. And only last week I showed it to Pastor Mark. I should have brought it. I forgot to bring it. But I showed it to Pastor Mark. In, in Africa now, in one of the African countries, there are those in the Catholic Church who are wanting to have animal sacrifices again in the church. I tell you, friends, it's become spurious. It, it's brought in things that have completely pushed aside the truth of God's word and replaced it with falseness. Claiming power to create the creator, that's what happens with the mass. That's why the mass is so blasphemous and so obnoxious to true Protestants because it claims that the priest has the power to turn the bread into the actual body of Jesus and the, blood into, uh, the wine into the actual blood of Jesus and to re-sacrifice him on the altar again and again and again. Transubstantiations, transferring the substance. It's a denial of the full efficacy of Christ's sacrifice. And dear friends, Mariology, where Mary is exalted above most, even against Jesus, approaching God through Mary instead of through Jesus, as we read just a short while ago in the New Testament. The Immaculate Conception is the belief that when she was conceived, she was born without sin, sinless. Changing God's holy law, the Ten Commandments, Abolishing the second commandment, which is thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. You shall not bow down to them. You've got to take those away because they do it. Replacing the holy Sabbath with the pagan Sunday, which they claim is a mark of their authority. And abbreviating the Ten Commandments, instead of the full meaning of the text, it's been moved to a single statement. Idolatry. I showed you a picture the other week of them actually kissing and caressing the statue of Jupiter in the, in the uh, temple in, in Rome. Venerating images and uh, praying to the saints and to Mary and veneration of the relics and 
the veneration of the holy bone, the immortality of the soul, that the soul, God said, the soul that sins, it shall die. God says that only God has immortality. But Rome says, no, we all have an immortal soul. That's a pagan teaching. You can trace it all the way back. And the idea of purgatory, you don't read of purgatory in the Bible. And even limbo for babies. The use of holy water and crisping, which is sprinkling or pouring instead of baptism by immersion, taking away the whole essence, the whole symbolism of the new birth in Christ. Godparents deciding on the child's behalf and then confirmation confirming the above decision and the last rites and pagan feast days and celibacy and so on. Can you see how Antichrist has replaced the great truths of God's word? And so, dear friends, what the climactic verse in Daniel chapter 8, verse 14 said, the angel... Uh, Daniel heard, how long is it going to be for this to be allowed to be trampled underfoot before something is done about it? And he answered, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, and then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Well, dear friends, time has gone, so I'm going to just quickly wrap through here. The little bit on in Daniel 8 is an apocalyptic symbol of both pagan and papal Rome that will follow through to the second coming of Christ as I've already indicated to you earlier, uh, those things have passed themselves all the way down against the year. And however, the spirit of Antichrist was formerly witnessed in the typologies of ancient Babylon. Those typologies have been manifested in history and will continue to do so, not just through what Rome did, but eventually through what the church did. And that is highlighted in the book of Revelation, where it refers to the fallen church of Babylon as well. And the chief antichrist motivator in the whole drama, of course, is Satan, because he works through human instrumentalities, human powers, to usurp the position of Christ. And as we're told, the antichrist will eventually meet its climax with those satanic delusions that the Bible says will take place in these last days. And so, my dear friends, one day soon, Jesus is going to come again because Jesus is the real, genuine Christ. And he has declared, in the world you face persecution, but take courage, I have conquered the world. Do not be afraid, little flock, he says. You know, many people think that uh, because a path is well trodden, it must be the right path. Jesus said, many there go down that way and it leads to destruction. But he says, narrow is the way that leads to eternal life, and few there be that enter it. Jesus said, fear not, little flock. Be faithful, little flock, for it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Well, we'll read this this afternoon. Uh, the next theme that comes after a little horn, as we've said before, is the taking place of the great judgment in heaven. And uh, then... Jesus comes and receives his kingdom. Because the purpose of the judgment, dear friends, is not to give God information. I'll, I'll go into that side of it this afternoon. But it's the ultimate purpose is for Christ to receive the subjects that make up his kingdom. Because when Jesus comes again, he's coming as king of kings and lord of lords. And a king must have a throne, and it says that he will come sit on the throne of his glory. Well, he can't come to receive his kingdom if he doesn't go over there for it. So in the judgment, it's those who are truly his that are identified. My dear friends, that's why I said to you last week, we need to make sure that we are right with God. We need to make sure that we have that right relationship with Jesus Christ. Because if not, when that judgment ends, it will be too late. And if we were to die today, which is possible, that would be our destiny, would be sealed, where we are in Christ. Are we in Christ or are we not? 
Are we truly related with him? It is important that our relationship with Jesus. Jesus said many will come in that day and say, this, that, and the other, and we say, I never knew you. There was no real relationship with each other. The Greek word he uses is ginosko to refer to an intimate relationship together. When Jesus comes, dear friend, he's coming as King of kings and Lord of lords for those who are waiting, the Bible says, preparing for his coming. So may God help us. Pastor, please come and pray with us that God will help us. And I do apologize for taking that extra time today, but the important material. Thank you. Let us pray. I, please stand. And let us pray. Heavenly Father, again, we want to thank you for these, uh, these important things. And we pray that you would help us to treasure them up in our hearts and to understand them more fully and live them out in our lives. Uh, so, Lord, we, uh, we thank you for this morning's session. And, Lord, now as we go into our fellowship lunch, we thank you for that as well. In Jesus' name, amen.